Hello everyone. Now we are going to continue learning about vaccine. So yesterday we had a introductory session about vaccine, some immunology related aspect. Today same is the thing we are going to do, like designing vaccines for active immunization. So we are going to discuss some types of vaccine. Some types in the sense, some primarily you know used types. So first live attenuated vaccines in some cases microorganisms can be attenuated so that they lost their ability to cause significant disease or pathogenicity but retain their capacity for transient growth within an inoculated host there are examples of agents that are naturally attenuated by virtue of their inability to cause disease in a given host although they can immunize the host the first vaccine used by Jenner is of this type, Vaccinia virus, cowpox. Inoculation of humans confers immunity to smallpox but does not cause smallpox. Attenuation can often be achieved by growing a pathogenic bacterium or virus for prolonged periods under abnormal culture conditions. This procedure selects mutants that are better suited to growth in the abnormal culture condition and are therefore less capable of growth in the natural host. For example, an attenuated strain of Mycobacterium bovis called the Bacillus calmate curin, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, BCG, was developed by growing M. bovis on a medium containing increasing concentration of bile. After 13 years, the strain had adapted to growing in strong bile and had become sufficiently attenuated that it was suitable as a vaccine for tuberculosis. For reasons related to variable effectiveness and difficulties in follow-up monitoring, BLG is not used in the United States. The Sabin polio vaccine and the missiles vaccine both consist of attenuated viral strains. The polio virus used in the Sabin vaccine was attenuated by growth in monkeys, monkey kidney epithelial cells. The missiles vaccine contains a strain of rubella virus that was drawn in duck embryo cells and later in human cell lines. Attenuated vaccines have advantages and disadvantages because of their capacity for transient growth. Such vaccines provide prolonged immune system exposure to individual epitoxon that emitted organisms, resulting in increased immunogenicity and production of memory cells. As a consequence, these vaccines often require only a single immunization, eliminating the need for repeated boosters. This property is a major advantage in third world countries where epidemiologic studies have shown that a significant number of individuals fail to return for subsequent boosters. The ability for many attenuated vaccines to replicate within host cells make them particularly suitable for indu inducing a cell mediated response. The Sabin polio vaccine, consisting of three attenuated strains of polio virus, is administrated orally to children on a sugar cube or in sugar liquid. The attenuated vax viruses colonize the intestine and induce protective immunity to all three strains of virulent polio virus. Sabin vaccine in the intestines induce production of secretory IgA which serves as an important defense against naturally acquired polio virus. The vaccine also induces IgM and IgG classes of antibody. Unlike most other attenuated vaccines which require a single immunizing dose, the Sabin polio vaccine requires boosters because the three strains of attenuated polio virus in the vaccine interfere with each other's replication in the intestine. With the first immunization, one strain will predominate in its growth, inducing immunity to that strain. With the second immunization, the immunity generated by the previous immunization will limit the growth of the previously predominant strain in the vaccine, enabling one of the two remaining strains to predominate and induce immunity. Finally, with third immunization, immunity to all three strains is achieved. A major disadvantage of attenuated vaccines is the possibility that they will revert to a virulent form. The rate of revision, reversion of the Sabin polio vaccine OPV leading to subsequent paralytic disease is about one case in 2.54 million doses of vaccine. This reversion implies that pathogenic 
forms of the virus are being passed by a few immunized individuals and can find their way into the water supply especially in areas where sanitization standards are not rigorous or where waste water must be recycled so disadvantage we discussed a major disadvantage of attenuated vaccines is the possibility that they will revert to a virulent form that is something scary so many people you know avoid vaccination due to this but that's not a correct way to do this okay igm ige and iga in this time with the first immunization one strain will predominate in its growth inducing immunity to that strain with the second immunization the immunity generated by the previous immunization will limit the growth of the previously predominant strain in the vaccine enabling one of the two remaining strains to predominate and induce immunity finally with the third immunization immunity to all three strains is achieved a major disadvantage of attenuated vaccines is the possibility that they will revert to a virulent form so a major disadvantage of attenuated vaccines is the possibility that they will revert to a virulent form the rate of reversion of the sabin polio vaccine opv leading to subsequent paralysis of disease is about one case in 2.5 million doses of vaccine this reversion implies that pathogenic forms of the virus are being passed by a few immunized individuals that can find their way into the water supply especially in areas where sanitization standards are not rigorous or where waste water must be recycled this possibility has led to the exclusive use of inactivated polio vaccines in this country so the projected eradication of a paralytic polio may be impossible as long as opv is used anywhere in the world the alternative inactivated salk vaccine will likely be substituted as the number of cases decreases although there are problems in delivering this vaccine in developing countries obviously the ultimate goal of eradication is to achieve a polio free world in which no vaccine is needed so attenuated vaccines also may be associated with complications similar to those seen in natural diseases a small percentage of recipients of measles vaccine for example develops post vaccine encephalitis for other complications as the risk of vaccine related complications is much lower than risks from infection an independent study showed that 75 million doses of measles vaccine were given between 1970 and 1993 with an incidence of 48 cases of vaccine related encephalopathy the low incidence of this side effect compared with the rate of encephalopathy associated with infection argues for the efficiency of the vaccine a more convincing argument for vaccination is the right high death rate associated with measles infection even in developed countries genetic engineering techniques provide a way to attenuate the virus irreversibly by selectively removing genes that are necessary for virulence or for growth in the vaccines this has been done with a herpes virus vaccine for pigs in which the thymidine kinase gene was removed because thymidine kinase is required for the virus to grow in certain types of cells neurons removal of this gene rendered the virus incapable of causing disease an attenuated live vaccine against influenza was developed recently and licensed under the name flumist the process of attenuation involves growing the virus at lower than normal temperature until a cold adapted strain resulted this flu virus strain grows well at temperatures lower than 37 degrees celsius but is unable to grow at human body temperatures of 37 degrees celsius this live attenuated virus is administered intravenously and causes a transient infection in the upper respiratory tract and infection sufficient to induce a strong immune response the virus cannot spread beyond the upper respiratory tract because of its inability or yeah inability to grow at the elevated temperatures of the inner body and is therefore limited in its range because of the case of administration and induction of good mucosal immunity cold adapted nasally administered flu vaccines will likely soon dominate the area and i personally want to take one of this because flu is something which you know disturbs me all the time so yeah i might consider taking a
live attenuated vaccines of flu and inactivated or killed vaccines one of the common means to achieve attenuation of a vaccine is inactivation of the pathogen by heat or chemical means so that the pathogen raises an immune response but is not capable of replication in the host it is critically important to maintain the structure of epitopes on surface antigens during inactivation heat inactivation is often unsatisfactory because it causes extensive denaturation of protein the seni epitopes that depend on higher orders of protein structure are likely to be altered significantly chemical inactivation with formaldehyde or various alkylating agents has been successful the salk polio vaccine is produced by formaldehyde inactivation of the polio virus and i want to read this once again inactivated or killed vaccine and the common means to achieve attenuation of a vaccine is inactivation of the pathogen by heat or chemical means so that the pathogen raises an immune response but is not capable of replication in the host it is critically important to maintain the structure of epitopes on surface antigens during inactivation heat inactivation is often unsatisfactory because it causes extensive denaturation of protein if there's any epitope that depend on higher orders of protein structure are likely to be altered significantly chemical inactivation with formaldehyde or various alkylating agents has been successful live attenuated vaccines generally require only one dose to induce long lasting immunity killed vaccines on the other hand often require repeated boosters to maintain the immune status of the host in addition killed vaccines induce a predominantly humoral antibody response they are less effective than attenuated vaccines in inducing cell mediated immunity and in eliciting a secretory iga response even though the pathogens they contain are killed inactivated whole organism vaccines still carry certain risk a serious complication with the first salk vaccine arose when formaldehyde failed to kill all the virus in two vaccine loads which caused paralytic polio in a high percentage of recipients this is also encountered in the manufacture of the inactivated vaccines large quantities of the infectious agent must be handled prior to inactivation and those exposed to the process are at risk of infection so inactivated or killed vaccines are you know kind of scary but still they are used large quantities of the infectious agent must be handled prior to inactivation and those exposed to the process are at risk of infection there have been reports of infection of individuals involved in the manufacture of the salk vaccine in general the safety of inactivated vaccines is greater than that of live attenuated vaccines which retain the capacity to replicate and possibly revert to an active form <laughs> so they are not scary <laughs> inactivated vaccines in common usage include those agents those against both viral and bacterial diseases the classic flu vaccine is of this type as are vaccines for hepatitis a and cholera in addition to their relative safety advantages of inactivated vaccines include stability and ease of storage and transport the requirement that most inactivated vaccines be administered by injection is a drawback to their use in mass immunization campaigns injection then subunit vaccines next is about subunit vaccines later we'll be learning about conjugate vaccines and recombinant vector vaccine then we'll be having a quick summary really really quick summary subunit vaccines many of the risks associated with attenuated or killed whole organism vaccines can be avoided with vaccines that consist of specific purified macromolecules derived from pathogens Three general forms of vaccines that are components or subunits of the target pathogen in current use are inactivated exotoxins or toxoids, capsula polysaccharides and recombinant protein antigens. Then toxoids are used as vaccines. Some bacterial pathogens including those that cause diphtheria and tetanus produce exotoxins that account for many of the disease symptoms that result from infection. Diphtheria and tetanus vaccines have been made by purifying the bacterial exotoxin and then inactivating it with formaldehyde to form a toxoid. Vaccination with the toxoid induces anti-toxoid antibodies which are capable of binding 
to the toxin and neuralizing its effects. Conditions for the production of toxoid vaccines must be closely controlled to avoid excessive modification of the epitop structure while accomplishing complete detoxification. So, obtaining sufficient quantities of the purified toxins to prepare the vaccines is achieved by cloning the exotoxin genes and expressing them in easily grown host cells. Passive immunity to toxin. So, some bacterial pathogens, including those that cause diphtheria and tetanus, produce exotoxins that account for many of the disease symptoms that result from infection. Diphtheria and tetanus vaccines have been made by purifying the bacterial exotoxin and then inactivating it with formaldehyde to form a toxoid. Vaccination with the toxoid induces anti-toxoid antibodies, which are capable of binding to the toxin and neutralizing its effects. Conditions for the production of toxoid vaccines must be closely controlled to avoid excessive modification of the epitop structure while accomplishing complete detoxification. Obtaining sufficient quantities of the purified toxins to prepare the vaccines is achieved by cloning the exotoxin genes and expressing them in easily grown host cells. Then passive immunity to toxin can be induced by transfer of serum containing anti-toxoid antibodies. As discussed, the treatment for diphtheria prior to the availability of antibiotics or the development of an effective vaccine entailed the administration of antitoxin usually produced in horses. Similarly, diseases in those exposed to tetanus can be prevented by treatment with tetanus antitoxin. If an individual who has not yet had a recent tetanus vaccination is exposed to tetanus, the antitoxin will be administrated. Botulism is treated with horse antitoxin, but to date, no toxoid vaccine against botulism has been developed for humans, and that's scary. <laughs> Next, bacterial polysaccharide capsules are used as vaccines. The virulence of some pathogenic bacteria depends primarily on the antiphagocytic properties of their hydrophilic polysaccharide capsule. Coating of the capsule with antibodies and the complement greatly increase the ability of macrophages and neutrophils to phagocytose such pathogens. These findings provide the rationales of vaccination consisting of purified capsular polysaccharides. Viral glycoproteins are candidate vaccines, although certain viral subunit glycoproteins such as an envelope protein from HIV-1 have been tested as vaccines with little success. Hope remains, but these glycoproteins can protect against some diseases. A recent clinical trial of glycoprotein D from herpes plus virus type 2 prevented genital herpes in some herpes in some vaccine vaccines. The glycoprotein vaccine has given with their adjuvant to male and female volunteers who were first tested for serum antibodies to HSV type 1 and 2. Selected participants were negative for HSV 2 antibodies and had regular sexual partners with a history of genital herpes. The vaccine was effective in preventing genital herpes in females who were surrogate seronegative for both HSV type 1 and type 2 at the onset of study but have little protection to those positive for HSV type 1 those cause oral which cause oral but not genital lesions no protection of male subjects was observed whether serum antibodies to HSV were present or absent then pathogen proteins are manufactured by recombinant techniques Pathogen proteins are manufactured by recombinant techniques. Theoretically, the gene encoding any immunogenic protein can be cloned and expressed in bacterial yeast or mammalian cells using recombinant DNA technology. A number of genes encoding surface antigens from viral, bacterial and protozoan pathogens have been successfully cloned into cellular expression systems and the expressed antigens used for vaccine development. The first such recombinant antigen vaccine approved for human use is the hepatitis B vaccine developed by cloning the gene for the major surface antigens of hepatitis B virus and expressing it in yeast cells. Recombinant yeast cells are grown in large farmers 
fermenters allowing HPS AG to accumulate in the cell. HPS AG in the sense hepatitis B virus. Surface antigen, major surface antigen of hepatitis B virus. So we are mentioning about the pathogen proteins are manufactured by recombinant technique. Which is then purified by conventional biochemical technique. Recombinant hepatitis B vaccine has been shown to induce the production of protective antibodies and hold much promise for the strength 250 million carriers of chronic hepatitis B worldwide. Many of the vaccines proposed for major disease such as malaria consist of one or more proteins from the pathogen. These proteins are biosynthesized in large quantities using appropriate cell lines and then purified using procedures that do not induce introduce contaminants into the product. Universal problem involving raising protective immune responses against these proteins. Certain adjuvants such as alum are approved for human use but the more effective ones such as shots complete or incomplete adjuvant generate unaccessible side effects. A recent area of inquiry involves the search for compounds that demonstrate a strong adjuvant effect without harm to the vaccine. Among the candidate compounds are those that activate dendritic cells and macrophages via toll-like receptors. These activation of cells of the innate immune system would mobilize a response by components of the adaptive immune system. Among the substances being tested for adjuvant effects are oligonucleotides with the sequence CPGN and common motifin bacteria and the components of the gram-negative bacterial cell wall such as LPS. Use of synthetic peptides as vaccines has progressed slowly. If subunit proteins can serve as successful vaccines, it follows that we should be able to identify their most effective or active epitope, create synthetic peptides that mimic those epitopes and use the peptide as vaccines. Advantages would include ease of synthesis under highly controlled conditions and virtually complete safety. Despite these very promising features, the use of synthetic peptides as vaccines has not progressed as originally hoped. Peptides are not as immunogenic as proteins and it is difficult to elicit both humoral and cellular immunity to them. The use of adjuvants and conjugates can assist in raising protective immunity to peptides. But the barrier to the widespread use of peptide vaccine remains balancing the disease. Appointment of peptide vaccine has been the steady advance in technique to produce recombinant proteins and transferred cell culture. Nonetheless, considerable theoretical interest remains in all aspects of immunity to peptides which may get gener yet to generate insights leading to new vaccines. Next is about conjugate vaccines. Conjugate vaccines. One limitation of polysaccharide vaccines is their inability to activate T head cells, T helper cells. They activate B cells in thymus independent type 2 TI1 manner, resulting in IgM production, but little class switching, no affinity maturation, and little, if any, development of memory cells. Several investigators have reported the introduction of IgA secreting plasma cells in humans receiving subcutaneous immunization with the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine. In this case, since TH cells are not involved in the response, the vaccine may activate IgA-specific memory B cells previously generated by naturally occurring bacterial antigens at mucosal surfaces. Because these bacteria have both polysaccharide and protein epitopes, they would activate TH cells, which in turn could mediate class switching and memory cell formation. One way to involve TH cell directly in the response to a polysaccharide antigen is to conjugate the antigen to some sort of protein carrier. For example, the vaccine for Haemophilus influenzae type B, HIV, the major cause of bacterial meningitis in children less than 5 years of age, consists of type B capsular polysaccharide covalently linked to a protein carrier, tetanus toxoid. The polysaccharide protein conjugate is considerably more immunogenic than the polysaccharide alone and because it activates T-H cells, it enables class switching from IgM to IgG. Although this type of vaccine can induce memory B cells, it cannot produce memory T cells specific for the pathogen. 
In the case of HIV vaccine, it appears that the memory B cells can be activated to some degree. In the absence of a population of memory T head cells, this accounting for the efficacy of this vaccine. So, HIV infection can lead to deafness and neurologic defects. The value of this vaccine is seen in countries with broad coverage by the conjugate vaccine. The rapid decline of HIV ceases in United States. So, one polysaccharide confers protection against several fungi. A recent study of a polysaccharide component of fungi gave promising results as a conjugate vaccine in animal studies. A recent study of a polysaccharide component of fungi gave promising results as a conjugate vaccine in animal studies. Immunization with beta glucan isolation isolated from brown alga and conjugated to diphtheria toxoid raised antibodies in mice and rats that protected against challenge with both aspergillus fumigatus and candida albicans. The protection was transferred by serum or vaginal fluid from the immunized animals indicating that the immunity is antibody based. This finding was supported when a monoclonal antibody raised against the beta glucan also conferred protection. Infections with fungal pathogens are a serious problem for immunocompromised individuals and the availability of immunization or antibody treatment could circumvent problems with toxicity of antifungal drugs while also helping to counter the problem of resistant strains emerging, an issue that is especially important in hospital settings. And multivalent subunit vaccines confer both cellular and humoral immunity. One of the limitations of synthetic peptide vaccines and subunit polysaccharide or protein vaccines is that they tend to be poorly immunogenic. They also tend to induce a humoral antibody response but are less likely to induce a cell mediated response. What is needed is a method for constructing synthetic peptide vaccines that contain both immunodominant B-cell and T-cell epitopes. Furthermore, if a CTL response is desired, the vaccine must be delivered intracellularly so that the peptide can be processed and presented together with class 1 MHC molecules. A number of innovative techniques are being applied to develop a multivalent vaccine that can present multiple copies of a given peptide or a mixture of peptides in the immune system. One approach is to prepare solid matrix antibody antigen complexes by attaching monoclonal antibodies to particulate solid matrices and then saturating the antibody with the desired antigen. The resulting complexes are then used as vaccines. By attaching multiple monoclonal antibodies to the solid matrix, it is possible to bind a mixture of polypeptide or proteins comprising immunodominant epitopes for both the T cell and B cell to their solid matrix. These multivalent complexes have been shown to induce vigorous humoral and cell mediated responses. Their particulate nature contributes to their increased immunogenicity by facilitating phagocytosis by phagocytic cells. Another means of producing a multivalent vaccine is to use the detergent to incorporate protein antigens into protein cells, lipid vesicles called liposomes or immunostimulating complexes. Mixing proteins in detergent and then removing a detergent forms in cells. The individual proteins orient themselves with their hydrophilic residues toward the aqueous environment and the hydrophobic residues at the center so as to exclude their interaction with the aqueous environment. Liposomes containing protein antigens are prepared by mixing the proteins with the suspension of phospholipids under conditions that form lipid bilayer vesicles. The proteins are incorporated into the bilayer with the hydrophilic residues exposed. Immunostimulating complexes ISCOMs are lipid carriers prepared by mixing proteins with the detergent and a glycoside called a quilly. So membrane proteins from various pathogens including Influenza virus, measles virus, hepatitis B virus and HIV 
have been incorporated into missiles ribosomes and ICS, iscoms and are currently being accessed as potential vaccines in addition to their increased immunogenicity liposomes and iscoms appear to fuse with the plasma membrane to deliver the antigen intracellularly where it can be processed by the cytosolic pathway and thus induce a cell mediated response DNA vaccines. A vaccination strategy under investigation for a number of diseases utilizes plasmid DNA encoding antigenic proteins which is injected directly into the muscles of the recipient. Muscle cells take up the DNA and the encoded protein antigen is expressed leading to both a humoral and antibody response and a cell mediated response. Most surprising about this technique is that injected DNA is taken up and expressed by the host muscle cell with much greater efficiency than in its tissue culture cells. The DNA appears either to integrate into the chromosomal DNA or to be maintained for longer periods in an episomal form. The viral antigen is expressed not only by the muscle cells but also by dendritic cells in the injection area. Muscle cells express low levels of class 1 MHC molecules and do not express co-stimulatory molecules suggesting that local dendritic cells may be crucial to the development of antigenic response to DNA vaccines. So DNA vaccines offer advantages over many of the existing vaccines. For example, the encoded protein is expressed in the host in its natural form. There is no denaturation or modification. The immune response is therefore injected directed to the antigen exactly as it is expressed by the pathogen and I am a bit confused about this DNA vaccine topic. So I am gonna slowly read that once again. A vaccination strategy and the investigation for a number of diseases utilizes plasmid DNA encoding antigenic proteins which is injected directly into the muscle of the recipient. Muscle cells take up the DNA and the encoded protein antigen is expressed leading to both humoral and antibody response and a cell mediated response. Most surprising about this technique is that the injected DNA is taken up and expressed by the host muscle cells with much greater efficiency than in its tissue culture cells. The DNA appears either to integrate into the chromosomal DNA or to be maintained for long periods in an episomal form. The viral antigen is expressed not only by the muscle cell but also by dendritic cells in the injection area. Muscle cells express low levels of class 1 MHC molecules and do not express co-stimulatory molecules suggesting that local dendritic cells may be crucial to the development of antigenic response to DNA vaccine. DNA vaccine often advantages over many of the existing vaccines. For example, the encoded protein is expressed in the host in its natural form. There is no denaturation or modification. The immune response is therefore directed to the antigen exactly as it is expressed by the pathogen. DNA vaccines also induce both humoral and cell mediated immunity to stimulate both arms of the adaptive immune response with non-DNA vaccines normally require immunization with a live attenuated preparation which induces additional elements of risk like reversion like that. Finally, DNA vaccines cause prolonged expression of the antigen which generates significant immunological benefit. Practical aspects of DNA vaccines are also very promising. Refrigeration is not required for the handling and storage of the plasmid DNA, feature that greatly robust the cost and complexity of delivery. The same plasmid vector can be custom tailored to make a variety of proteins so that one manufacturing operation can produce a variety of DNA vaccines, each encoding antigen from a different pathogen. An improved method for administrating these vaccines is real coating microscopic gold beads with the plasmid DNA and then delivering to coated particles through the skin into the underlying muscle with an air gun called a gene gun. This will help, this will allow rapid delivery of vaccine to large populations without the requirement for huge su supplies of needle and syringe. Tests of DNA vaccines in animal models have shown that these vaccines are able to induce protective immunity against a number of pathogens including influenza and rabies virus it has been further shown that the inclusion of certain dna sequences in the vector lead to enhanced immune response on such sequences the cpg sequence found in pathogens recall that the sequence is the ligand for p l r 9 at present human trials are underway with several different dna vaccines including those for malaria aids influenza ebola and herpes virus a recent environmental 
experimental success of a DNA vaccine provided protection of mice against challenges by SARS coronavirus using a DNA vector including spike protein of the SARS virus. Immunity was transferred with serum from vaccine recipients demonstrating that neutralizing antibodies resulted from vaccination and were protective in the mouse SARS infection model. Future experimental trials of DNA vaccine will mix genes for antigenic proteins with the genes for cytokines or chemokines that direct the immune response to the epitimum pathway. The IL-12 gene may be included in a DNA vaccine. Expression of IL-12 gene may be included in a DNA vaccine. Expression of IL-2 at 12 at a site of immunization will stimulate the H1 type immunity induced by the vaccine. And DNA vaccines are in clinical testing and will likely be used for human immunization within the next five years. However, five years or few years, however, they are not a universal solution to the problems of vaccination. For example, only protein antigens can be encoded. And certain vaccines test those for pneumococcal and meningococcal infections use polysaccharide antigens and are not candidates for delivery via DNA. The next last category is recombinant vector vaccines. Genes that encode major antigens of especially virulent pathogens can be introduced into attenuated viruses or bacteria. Attenuated organism serves as a vector, replicating within the host and expressing the gene product of the pathogen. Live attenuated virus vaccines have been prepared utilizing existing licensed vaccines and adding to them genes encoding antigens present on newly emerging pathogens. Such chimeric virus vaccines, vaccines can be more quickly tested and approved than an entirely new product, the saving valuable time. A very recent example of this type of chimera is the yellow fever vaccine that was engineered to express antigens of West Nile virus. A number of organisms have been used for vector vaccine including vaccinia virus, the canary pox virus, attenuated poliovirus, adenoviruses, attenuated strains of salmonella and the BCG strain of Mycobacterium bovis, then the certain strains of Streptococcus that normally exist in the oral cat. So, vaccinia virus, the attenuated vaccines used to eradicate smallpox, has been widely employed as a vector vaccine. This large complex virus with a genome of about 200 genes can be engineered to carry several dozen of foreign genes without impairing its capacity to infect host cells and replicate. The procedure of producing a vaccine vector that carries a foreign gene from a pathogen is outlined. The genetically engineered vaccine express high levels of inserted gene product which can then serve as a potent immunogen in the inoculated host. Like the smallpox vaccine, genetically engineered vaccine vector vaccines can be administrated simply by stretching the skin causing a specialized infection in host cells. If the foreign gene product exposed, expressed by the vaccinia in a viral envelope protein, it is inserted into the membrane of the infected host cell, inducing development of cell-mediated immunity as well as antibody-mediated immunity. Other attenuated vector vaccines may prove to be safer than the vaccinia vaccine. The canary pox virus has recently been tried as a vector vaccine like its relative vaccine the canary pox virus is large and easily engineered to carry multiple genes unlike vaccinia the canary pox virus does not appear to be virulent even in individuals with severe immune suppression another possible vector is an attenuated strain of salmonella typhimuria which has been engineered with genes from this bacterium that cause cholera the advantage of this vector vaccine is the salmonella infects cells of the mucosal lining of the gut and therefore will induce secretory IgA production. Effective immunity against a number of diseases including cholera and gonorrhea depends on increased production of secretory IgA at mucous membrane surfaces. Similar strategies using bacteria that are a normal part of oral flora are in development. The strategy would induce involve introduction of gene encoding antigens from pathogenic organisms into bacterial strains that inhabit the oral cavity or respiratory tract. Eliciting immunity at the mucosal surface could provide excellent protection at the portal used by the pathogen. So a state of immunity can be induced by passive or active immunization. Short term passive immunization is induced by transfer of preformed antibodies. Infection or vaccination achieves long term active immunization. 
Three types of vaccines are currently used in humans. Live attenuated microorganisms, inactivated microorganisms or purified macromolecules. Protein components of vaccines expressed in cell culture may be effective vaccines. Polysaccharide vaccines may be contributed to proteins to maximize immunogenicity. Recombinator vectors involving viruses or bacteria engineered to carry genes from infectious microorganisms maximize cell mediated immunity to encoded antigens. Plasmid DNA encoding protein antigens form a pathogen induced both humoral and cell mediated immunity. DNA vaccines to several diseases are in human clinical trials. Realizing the optimum benefit of vaccines will require cheaper manufacture and improved delivery methods for existing vaccines. So, we just quickly learned the vaccines. Thank you for listening.